All of God's prophets came with miracles, signs of God's existence, to prove they were sent by God. Islam defines a miracle as an extraordinary act or event that goes against the laws of nature. It can only come through the direct intervention and will of God. Miracles are not magic, which by definition are only tricks or illusions. Acts of magic are evil acts performed with the help of devils. Miracles can only be performed by prophets. Past prophets were supported with them as irrefutable evidence providing that their prophethood was in fact a matter of truth. The prophets were supported by miracles that their nations excelled in, so the acts would be more convincing, understood, appreciated, and identified by the people of the nation, and not just thought of just magic. For instance, the people of Egypt excelled in magic and sorcery, and felt that they have reached the pinnacle of these evil acts, as they often were in contact with the evil spirits to play illusions on people. Thus, God provided Prophet Moses types of miracles that were related to illusions, such as the power to transform his staff into a snake right before his people. He was also able to strike the Nile with his rod to transform the river into blood, as well as part the Red Sea, all meant to humble his people and remind them that the power, control, and might of God is true and not just an illusion of the eyes. Likewise, the Romans of the time pride themselves in their medicine, healing, cures, and the best of doctors on land when medical science was at its height. Thus God sent down Prophet Jesus with several miracles all coming from this nature, which could not be justified by medical science. These miracles include the miraculous birth of Prophet Jesus of a virgin. Additionally, Prophet Jesus was able to heal leopards, cure the blind, and resurrect the dead, all with the permission and will of God. Past prophets had miracles one can only see if they lived in that time to witness it. After the prophets died, their miracles turned into stories that could only be narrated and witnessed by the following generations. For instance, for someone that witnessed Prophet Moses transform his staff into a snake, or someone that saw Prophet Jesus give life to a dead person with the permission of God, can only share it with his children and his children can narrate it to their children, and so forth. However, for the generations that were not alive or present to witness the miracles, they became only stories to them. All previous miracles were limited to its time and place. However, for our nation, God has provided our Prophet Muhammad's miracle, the Holy Quran, to be a witness by everyone for all upcoming generations. The miracle is as convincing now as it was when it was first revealed. The proofs and arguments of the Quran is as convincing and relevant as it was when it first was revealed 1400 years ago. The Quran is a miracle for the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Since the Quran is the final book to mankind, it had to outlive Prophet Muhammad, so it was audible. In the time of Prophet Muhammad, the Arabs, although predominantly unlettered, were masters of the spoken word. They were people that excelled in the art of eloquence and knowledge. Their poetry and spoken word was considered a model of literary excellence and they valued spoken word and speech. Thus God revealed to his final nation the best and the most eloquent of all speeches, the Holy Quran, which left the people of Prophet Muhammad astounded in terms of eloquence and in other terms. The book was revealed to a prophet who was unlettered, unable to read, write, or calculate to prove to the people his prophet was not the author. Billions of people since the advent of this miracle have witnessed it, believed in it due to its miraculous nature, in terms of its style, content, and spiritual uplifting. The Holy Quran mentions recounted stories of previous nations that were sent down prophets and messengers to convey God's message. But the people rejected, disobeyed, and denied the truth. God states, And nothing has prevented us from sending signs except the former peoples denied them. Between Prophet Adam and Prophet Noah were ten centuries. Amongst the people of that time were righteous individuals that obeyed the laws taught by Prophet Adam and worshipped God accordingly. As time passed, people started to veer away from the remembrance of God. Certain righteous men amongst them would remind the people of their obligations to God. Later, the righteous men began to die, and Satan, the enemy of mankind, came whispering to the people who had looked up to these righteous individuals, putting thoughts into their minds in his sly, deceptive ways, inspiring the people to erect statues in their memory as a way to remember to worship God. 
After these statues were built across the land, Satan later came back to the people who had forgotten the reason why these statues were constructed. Satan then suggested to the people to worship the statues directly. He told them that these statues had been worshipped by their forefathers. Out of these people's ignorance, idol worshipping started. Soon after that, Allah sent messengers after messengers to guide people to the right path. God stated in the Quran, Satan had overcome them and made them forget the remembrance of Allah. Those are the party of Satan. Unquestionably the party of Satan, they will be the losers. God sent Prophet Noah to his people where he preached for 950 years, calling people to worship one God and follow his commandments. But only a few people believed in him. His people denied, mocked him, and stated that he is nothing special but another human being amongst them. Noah agreed that he was only human, but he was sent from God with a clear warning. After the denial, God instructed Noah to build an ark. And construct the ship under our observation and our inspiration, and do not address me concerning these who have wronged. Indeed, they are to be drowned. As he was building the ark, his people accused him of being a madman for building a ship made of planks and nails on land. Nowhere near any body of water. Soon water started to gush from the earth and fall from the sky. God instructed Noah to enter the ark with the ones that believed in the message. He also commanded Prophet Noah to take a male and female of every animal aboard. Then God caused a great flood where water gushed from every crack on the earth and rain fell from the skies like never before. Prophet Noah saw his son overwhelmed by the water, so he cried out to him, pleading him to board the ark and to leave the non-believers to their fate. However, his son was thinking in terms of this worldly life and did not rely on the trust in the word of God. He replied to his dad that he would take himself to a mountain where the waves could not reach. Prophet Noah pled to with his son, saying, there is no protector today from the decree of God except from those who he has mercy. His son refused. God then stated, O earth, swallow your water, and O sky, withhold your rain. And the water subsided, and the matter was accomplished. And the ship came to rest on Mount Judy. And it was said, Away with the wrongdoing people. Soon his son was drowned. He was drowned with the disbeliever and Noah's wife, who also disbelieved. The flood had cleansed the earth from idol worshippers and disbelievers. Not a single person who had disbelieved in God remained on earth. The ship remains intact upon Judy right until today. An archaeological study found the 500 foot long boat shaped formation atop Mount Judy. God left it as a sign for mankind. Prophet Hud, Hebrew in English, was sent to an ancient tribe called Ad, who are believed to have been positioned in an area of curved sand hills of Oman and Yemen. They worship idols as gods, which they believed would provide them happiness and wealth and protect them from evil, harm, and all catastrophes. The people of Prophet Hud were very tall, strong, and well-built. They were arrogant people who would boast and tyrannize people with their huge size. According to the Qur'an, they would say, Who is greater than us in strength? They were known to build lofty towers. Thus, the area became known as the land of a thousand pillars since God blessed them with fertile land and abundant agriculture, many children, and an ample supply of livestock and easy access to water resources. They mistakenly understood the purpose of life was to accumulate wealth, prestige, and live in luxury. Prophet Hud would command them to fear God and to be righteous. According to the Quran, Prophet Hud would say to his people, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no deity other than Him. You are not but inventors of falsehood. Their prophet advised them to seek God's forgiveness for their heedlessness and arrogance and advised them that if they seek forgiveness, God will increase them in power, strength, and wealth. According to the Quran, Prophet Hud would state, And, O my people, ask forgiveness for of your Lord and then repent to Him. He will send rain from the sky upon in showers and increase you in strength, added to your strength and do not turn away, being criminals. However, they proudly saw themselves as the most powerful nation in existence. They rejected their prophet's message, believing after death their bodies would decay to dust and be swept away by the wind. With their hearts and minds filled with the accumulation of this world, they would say to their prophet, Why did God choose you when you are no different than the rest of us? You eat and drink like the rest of us. Prophet's Hood's people arrogantly stated, 
have you come in order to turn us away from our gods? Then bring upon us the calamity which you were threatening us with. If you are telling the truth, prophet who turned to God and renounced his people. Soon after, the people of Hud suffered a three-year famine and a drought which spread throughout the once green, fertile, abundant land. The people looked to the sky, hoping to see signs of rain. One fateful day, the weather changed. The burning heat changed to furious, violent winds which God imposed on them for seven nights and eight days. The winds ripped apart their homes and possessions. The winds ripped upon their clothes and even the skin on their bodies. Their crops were swallowed and buried by the sands of their desert. Only Prophet Hud and his small band of believers were saved and are believed to have migrated to the Hadramoth area, what is today known as southern Yemen. God states, Have you not considered how your Lord dealt with Ad, had lofty pillars, the likes of whom had never created in land? God also speaks in the Quran of a nation where he sent one of his messengers named Salih. He was sent to a tribe named Thamud. While many of the prophets mentioned in the Quran are prophets shared with Christianity and Judaism, thus their stories are mentioned in the Bible, Muslims traditionally believe in all the past messengers and prophets of God. Prophet Saleh is not mentioned in the Bible today. Similar to the people of Hud, the people of Saleh were also people that cultivated very rich, fertile land, led wealthy, excessive lives, built grand buildings, and had become very vain because of their wealth. Regretfully, with their extravagant lifestyles came the worship of many gods, oppressing the poor and living a life which went against their Lord's commandments. Prophet Saleh was a pious, righteous man who held a position of leadership in their community. But his call to worship God alone angered many of his people. Prophet Saleh's message was similar to all other prophets. He warned his people to turn away from worshiping false gods and to follow the one God, Allah, who provided them all their substance. He advised them to thank their one true creator and advised the rich to stop oppressing the poor and to end all mischief and evil in the land. The people of Thamud gathered in the shadows of a great mountain where they demanded that Prophet Saleh prove that the one God he spoke of was truly mighty and strong. They asked him to perform a miracle. They challenged him to produce for them an incomparable she-male out of which must be 10 months pregnant, tall, attractive, which will emerge from the rock. Prophet Saleh asked them if a she-camel appeared would they then believe in his message? They responded yes and prayed with Prophet Saleh for the miracle to be emerged. By the power and will of God, a massive pregnant she-camel emerged from the rocks at the bottom of the mountain. They saw a great powerful clear sign from their Lord. A number of Prophet Saleh's people believed, yet most of them continued to their disbelief and stubbornness. Even though they witnessed a great miracle, the Quran states, and nothing has prevented us from sending signs except that the former people denied them. And we gave Thamud, the she-camel, as a visible sign, but they wronged her. And we sent not the signs except as a warning. The she-camel lived among people of Thamud. Later, the people began to complain that the camel drank too much water and frightened the other livestock. Prophet Saleh began to fear for the camel. He warned his people of a great suffering that would befall them if they harmed the she-camel. And O oh my people, this is the she-camel of Allah. She is to you a sign. So let her feed upon Allah's earth and do not touch her with harm or you will be taken by an impending punishment. A group of his people got together and plotted to kill the she-camel. When they approached her, they shot their arrow and pierced her with a sword. They cheered and congratulated each other while mocking and laughing at their prophet. Then they dared Prophet Saleh to have God punish them for it. Their prophet warned them that a great punishment would be upon them within three days, while hoping his people would realize their mistake and repent for their massive error. Prophet Saleh and the believers then departed together to Palestine to be saved from God's upcoming punishment. Soon, the sky was filled with lightning and thunder and the earth shook aggressively with a frightening earthquake or volcanic eruption. No one, including their idols, were able to save them. The final result of these nations' transgression was destruction. According to the Quran, when punishment came to these sinners, their only last utterance was, indeed, we were wrongdoers. 
In the end of the day, they cried out for mercy, but it was too late. When they approached their doom, they cried out. But the time for deliverance was already past. This brings us to an important point. Why is there so many nations that rejected, hid, denied, and buried the message of these prophets and messengers? There are a number of reasons. The message that the prophets came with went against everything that these nations were brought up and believed and raised with. It goes against the beliefs of their forefathers. These people had a strong attachment to the customs of their forefathers and were very sensitive with the regard to the good name of their forefathers. They took pride in following their footsteps, whether right or wrong. They grew up worshipping idols. And the prophets came and told them that they were wrong, and only Allah alone is worthy of worship without any partners or sons. These idol worshippers felt the prophets wanted to dethrone their gods and did not tolerate the Muslims' rejection of their gods and reacted with serious harassment and abuse. God states in the Qur'an, And when it was said to them, follow what Allah has revealed, they say, Rather, we will follow that which we found our fathers doing. God shares a conversation between Prophet Abraham and the idol worshippers at his time, which included his own father. When he said to his father and his people, What do you worship? They said, We worship idols and remain to them devoted. He said, Do they hear what you supplicate? Or do they benefit you or harm you? They said, But we found our fathers doing thus. The disbelievers of some nations rejected their prophet because they were a mere mortal who eats, drinks, and walks the markets like everyone else does. To be convinced of his prophethood, they arrogantly wanted God to send an angel down from heaven to accompany him. Some of the unbelievers accused their prophet of incorporating into his alleged revelation myths, legends, and fables that were well known to the people of that time. God states in his book, Even when they come to you arguing with you, those who disbelieve say, This is not but legends of former peoples. Certain nations believed in many gods, and some of their cities were dedicated to those gods. They allowed people from all around come to worship their idols. If Islam told them that they were wrong, and that Allah is the only one that should be worshipped, and all other gods are false, their city would begin to decline in visitors and in revenue. It would be the end of their political and economic domination. Greed, selfishness, money, and power got the best of them. The prophets came to nations with immense difficulties and conditions. This call to true Islam took the slumbering men by surprise. These people's customs and habits were sunk low. Adultery, liquor, gambling, violence, stealing, dishonesty, murder, and all sorts of illicit practices were widespread among them. These were all condemned by Islam, and embracing Islam meant leaving all of them and adopting a new model of life, which many were unwilling to change their wicked old habit. In addition, there was the desire for worldly things which had become so predominant in them. They soon became slaves to their own desires, that nothing could move them from this, not even the command of God. Islam came down to free people from being slaves to their own desires and constant needs for material good. That will never make someone permanently happy. Certain number of these nations contained proud and arrogant people that did not consider anyone else his or her equal. Slaves were practically looked down upon and were wrongfully treated. Soon after, Islam came down and sought to stop the pride and racism and to establish a universal brotherhood. Islam taught people, whether the slave or the master, are all at the same level and Islam taught the best amongst them were only the ones with the most piety righteousness, fear, and God consciousness. This angered many of the tribe's chieftains. God the Almighty has mentioned stories of perished nations and their wrongdoings in the Holy Quran to warn our nation from making the same mistakes they did. The repeating of the same mistakes they did can lead us to the same outcome. Unfortunately, the current average Muslim hardly recites the Quran with deep reflection and pondering to over its deep verses and signs. By comparing the past nations to our nation, one would come to a conclusion that our nation is in serious danger. The same sinful deeds that were done in the past are done by today's current Muslims. We see the same errors happening now that happened in the past, such as disobeying God's commandments and associating partners with Him, 
behaving arrogantly, wrongfully, and sinfully. All the nations of the past have been punished through natural disasters. God has given our nation warnings that if we repeat the same errors and sins the past nations did, we, we would be punished too. God states, Then has it not become clear to them how many generations we destroyed before them as they walk among their dwellings? Indeed, in that are signs for those of intelligence. In addition, God shares these stories in the Quran to warn people about the punishment of nations that disobeyed their Creator. Allah states, have they not traveled through the earth and observed how was the end of those before them? They were greater than them in power, and they plowed the earth and built it up more than they have built it up. And their messengers came to them with clear evidences. And Allah would never ever have wronged them, but they were wronging themselves. God also states, And never would your Lord have destroyed the cities until He had sent to their mother a messenger reciting to them our verses. And we would not destroy the cities except while their people were wrongdoers. It's important to indicate God punishes nations when they disobey their messenger, while their prophet is present amongst them. This is because when the messenger invites people to worship one God, often the rejecters and the deniers would mock their messengers, prosecute them, attack them, and sometimes even kill them. They would also sarcastically ask the messengers of God if they were indeed God's messenger, then ask God to send down a punishment to us right now. They asked for their punishment to be hastened, so it's only fair they got punished. In addition, God destroys people when they collectively insist on evil after a number of repeated warnings. Nations that refused to accept faced God's wrath and were destroyed whilst those who believed in God's messengers attained the means to everlasting success and salvation. So read the Qur'an and take lessons from the stories of the past nations. Reminisce on the nations whom reached the pinnacle of civilization, amassing great wealth and power and prestige, only to be ungrateful and forget themselves and their Lord. They became corrupt, arrogant, cruel, and oppressive, as they lived ungrateful lives and turned to falsehoods and false gods. God sent to them his prophets, supported with miracles and revelation, to remind them of his favors, to be just, and to remind them to be compassionate amongst themselves and his creation at large. But they disbelieved in God, despite his clear signs and warnings. God destroyed nations that disbelieved and denied the truth, and some until today. Ruins of civilians, cities, and nations can still be seen as a reminder, proof, and a sign to mankind. God is the most merciful and the most forgiving. He loves to forgive. However, God is also just, and His warning should not be ignored, rejected, or denied, because God's punishment can be rapid and severe. Our prophet narrated, whoever guides another to a good deed will get a reward similar to the one who performs it. So please like, subscribe, and share this video. Assalamu alaikum.